I'm Paul Cameron, director of photography for uh, episode one of season three of Westworld. And you're listening to the Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions. This is the Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So today's episode is all about Westworld season three. And we've got Paul Cameron, the director of photography, back on the show. I think he's been on twice before. I think he's been on once for each season. And um, and he's a great guest. He has a lot to say, particularly about how he's, you know, visually changed the show for season three. It takes place in a different part of the world, you know? It takes place outside of the park and uh, looks so different from season two and one but has to maintain some sort of consistency so you know what show you're watching. And this is not an easy thing to do. And Paul does a great job of it and talks to us a lot about how he achieved it. So if you guys are fans of Westworld, if you're fans of cinematography, you are going to love this one. So I'm here with Paul Cameron, ASC. He's a cinematographer and also the director of photography of the premiere episode of Westworld season three and so much more. Paul, welcome back to the Go Creative Show. Well, thanks, man. Good to be here. Thank you so much. I am, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about Westworld. Um, mm-hmm. We had you on for the first season and I know he, in this season, you've directed the first episode. I'm sorry, you directed the fourth episode, but DP'd the first episode. So you've been mm-hmm. involved in this now franchise for a while. And I certainly want to talk about how it's ebbed and flowed and changed and where the, you know, how the vision has changed and the look has changed. Uh, but I have to ask here up front, I mean, we're in, you know, right smack and hopefully the middle or near end of this coronavirus outbreak. And it's mm-hmm. impacted production so much. Um, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And how, how has this changed your, uh, your life? Well, I'll, you know, to address that, I mean, obviously it's challenging times right now. I mean, we're, 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 uh, you know, obviously hoping that, that, uh, the virus gets under control soon and, and things go, you know, go back to normal as quickly as possible. You know, obviously production's massively affected and a lot of things we're all hoping and booked on to do, we're not doing. So, yeah. Uh, I think the other thing is just community wise, we're all there for everybody and we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, anybody who needs help or anything, now's the time. Um, so yeah, that's it. Nothing, what do you, uh, what do nothing. you think, like, do you have any advice for people as far as like, how do you stay creative? How do you, you know, keep that muscle well, flexed during good, this time? That's a good thing. It's, um, to talk about actually, I think, you know, part of, part of the craft of certainly, uh, as a cinematographer and now directing a little bit, you know, I, I believe in, you know, whatever the circumstances, you've got to surround yourself in, in the discipline of your work on some level, you know, and, and specifically beginning with inspiration. And that may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but I think it's important for everybody to stay in touch and for people to interact, you know, through, through internet and on the telephone as much as possible and try to keep, keep the momentum going of, of the creative process as much as possible. And, and then, you know, there's ways to do it. You just got to actively force your mind to do something every day and reach out to people because uh, we're all in the same boat. Nobody wants to be home and alone and uh, we all want to do our work and, and it's a collaborative experience out there. So we're all, you know, got to find ways to collaborate with the circumstances we have. Something that I've been kind of encouraging people to do, especially, you know, cinematographers in particular is use this time to learn editing, use yeah. this time, you know, learn a new skill, go and use some of your footage that you've taken and just practice, cut, 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 learn new programs. I mean, th- this no, is kind of the time. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, specifically now it's, it's so easy to, I mean, you can edit on your phone for, you know, quite, quite easily. So, you know, actually to, to learn that, that, uh, that craft is something I would highly recommend. It's, it's, it's something when you're communicating with a director and, you know, you have very little time to deal with, you know, um, getting all the setups and, and coverage you might need for a certain scene, and it really helps having editing experience and kind of knowing what's going to work and what's not going to work and, and what are the, you know, what are the go-to shots to get out of this and, and what are the great shots I can do in the time to make it even better, you know? Yeah. It's, 
It's an interesting time for sure. I mean, I, I oh. certainly can't remember anything like this ever before. And uh, people are spending a lot more time at home on their devices. Like there is a way to use this time wisely. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're still at the beginning of this, the new kind of quarantine lifestyle over the next few weeks or how long, who knows, mm -hmm. but there's a way, there's got to be a way to use this time wisely and come out stronger and better. There has to be. Yeah. I hope, I uh, hope for everybody's sake, they, they stay engaged, you know, just stay engaged and do the work and, 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 uh, take advantage of the time now. Cause you know, later there won't be less time and you'll wish you had it back. Hmm. Now I know a lot of productions have stopped, uh, midway through seasons mm -hmm. is Westworld season three completely finished. Yeah. Westworld, um, season three is, uh, was done, done shooting about two months ago. Okay. And, um, all that remains is the, uh, editorial and post-production staff and, you know, the, but it's still, it's, you know, it's in its finishing phase. So it's relying on, on, you know, stages for sound mixing and, mm. You know, so all of that stuff's being affected. They're they're figuring all that out now, how it's going to get finished for for the end of the season. But um, you know, fortunately, I think the first four episodes, so uh, going through April fifth, uh, that's all covered, and um, I believe they're just trying to finish out of four uh, four many ones. Talk to us a little bit about your involvement in Westworld, just kind of top level, because I know you were involved in season one. You came on our show to talk about it, um, but then we had mm -hmm. John Grillo on for season. Two, I believe, and maybe my mm -hmm. my notes are wrong. Um, and I know he's involved in this season as well, and so are you. And like you know, like a whole bunch of shows out there, Westworld is one that sort of has a team of directors of photography, and uh, yes. some of them, like yourself, are also transitioning into directing some episodes. So there's a lot going on, and I, I'd love to just bring people up to speed with you know your involvement in the franchise, and especially in this new season. Yeah, I'll kind of um, you know back it up to your original question. It's you know, listen, I. I remember I got a call from Jonah Nolan, um, Jonathan Nolan about, um, May something, I think in 2015 about coming in to, to talk about the show. And that was the, that was the beginning of kind of, uh, this long, longer streaming, uh, experience that I've had. And, you know, it's been fascinating to be involved on, on the, on, uh, on the beginning of it and designing the whole show in terms of the look of the show and the feeling of what is the park. And, and, and now suddenly it's, you know, four or five years later and we're still <laughs> still on the same project and, uh, you know, I've bounced in on, you know, and out on commercials and movies, you know, throughout, throughout the uh, seasons. So it's been fascinating for me actually to come back and see the, uh, the kind of, um, arc of the show and just kind of, you know, specifically watching great DPs like, you know, John Grillo and Zoe White and Darren Tiernan and David Mullen and, you know, so many more DPs that have kind of come and, gone and helped out on the show and it's been very exciting to see you know them take uh you know kind of a base a base look that i've set in the past and kind of do their own own magic with it and you know it's i've seen some exceptional work out there so it's fun to watch you know um but i, I you know what I, what i love uh, this season is 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 also having the experience of shooting the first one and also you know the opportunity to direct episode four this season i was able to read all the scripts so i know you know the arc of the whole season and i've seen you know a few of them um, edited and we've already had the first one premiere last week so it's been quite um, fascinating for me to see how how to maintain this kind of level of, of drama on a streaming service and kind of how high the bar is set by um, jonathan nolan and lisa joy it's absolutely incredible to me the the, how the show has visually evolved. Like mm -hmm. the show has always had a futuristic component yeah. because, you know, you had the the park, which was this Western world. But then you mm -hmm. also had like the behind the scenes, the the production of the park, I guess we'll say the underground part. Yeah. Um, and then we transitioned into the, into the quote real world outside of mm -hmm. the park. And it just keeps getting different, more and more different as it goes. I, I really, I can't think of another show where each season is completely different from the previous. Yeah. It, like there, there has to be a challenge for you as a director of photography mm -hmm. and certainly as a director too, to maintain some sort of, some feeling mm -hmm. of familiarity, but also provide a completely new look each time. Yeah. I think, you know, listen, there's kind of the base look of the show and then, 
you know, this is the new, uh, the new frontier on the show. It's 2058. We're in Los Angeles. That's, you know, pretty much what we know from, from the first episode here. And it, it is a, you know, it is the future. Um, and I, you know, taking my cues from Jonathan Nolan and Howard Cummings, the production designer now is, you know, listen, we didn't, we, we, we traveled around the world. We looked at a lot of futuristic cities. We, we kind of fell in love with, with Singapore, it made the most sense to us is like, that seems to be the city organized for the future. Mm. Uh, if LA was organized for the future, it would look, you know, it would look similar to that. And, you know, we kind of felt, let's make this hybrid between LA and Singapore where there's a kind of this vertical futuristic structure. And, and, you know, to Jonathan and Howard's credit, it's, you know, they felt like the world is going to be less polluted with billboards and, you know, it will be less of a Ray Bradbury kind of a uh, outlook on, on the future here. And, you know, it's about, you know, 150 story buildings with massive parks at different levels of the building and plants growing over the edges and walkways and, you know, and then obvious things like, yeah, we're going to be going around in drones and, and, you know, driverless cars and, and that whole aspect and driverless motorcycles. So, you know, that, that hybrid of, of the future and, and, and tying it into the look of the, the previous episodes. I mean, the photography that everybody's been doing on it, the cinematography has been, been brilliant. And, you know, again, since the visual bar, the sets so high, it's like, Oh God, what do we do this season? Well, you know, we kind of, you know, again, it's a film based show. We shoot 35 millimeter film on the show. And that, that's, that's a very important, um, to Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy and the people at Kilter Films the, to maintain that. And we tested some digital stuff and integrated some night night digital photography on some wide shots. And um, so we are we are kind of embracing, you know, current technology and, and what's the you know, we did a lot with LED wall similar to Mandalorian and mm-hmm. and that whole thing. So, you know, the show is definitely progressing in the technology <laughs> level as well. So, but it's been fun and it's, you know, um, it was great to have John Grillo back and, uh, they added Zoe White this year who shot a few episodes and, um, yeah, it's great to see everybody kind of run with, uh, run with a new look. So as you're developing the look, you, you're traveling to all these different countries throughout mm-hmm. the world or cities, I'd say, I should say yeah. throughout the world. And, uh, you, you would mention that Singapore is kind of like, the cross between Singapore and LA in the future is what Mm -hmm. made the most sense for you guys. I want to just dive a little bit more into that about what were the elements in Singapore that you found that felt like it made sense for this future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, 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 it's many aspects of it. One again, is you know, just mentioned was kind of the vertical nature of the city. It's, you know, very tall buildings packed into a small area. Many of them have rooftop gardens or gardens midway that, you know, so the greens are bursting out of the sides of the building and dropping down, you know, 20, 30 floors and, and going to, you know, almost the ground. So there's this kind of vertical aspect that's connected with walkways and, 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 um, you know, weird overhangs that we haven't seen architecturally or structurally before. And, um, that's one aspect of it. Then you've got the kind of, uh, the other one is the roads, which is kind of an amazing thing about Singapore is if you drive around Singapore morning, noon, and night, you're going to find very little traffic. And Hmm. it's kind of astounding. You know, I mean, there's an economic reason for that is because they basically, if you want to, you know, buy the equivalent of a $50,000 car from whatever country and import it, it's going to cost you roughly double to get it on the street. So if you buy a $50,000 car, it's going to cost you a hundred thousand. So mm-hmm. there's a lot, a lot of people taking public transportation and there's a lot, you know, and that is, um, uh, amazing as well. But the thing to get over is you, before I go into that, is you're driving around and scouting and you're looking at these places and you see like, there's very few cars, you know, and there's five lane roads coming, you know, from the airport. And then you realize, you know, it's a five lane in and out from the airport to the city. And you look down the center meridian and, and they have temporary pots in the, in that are massive in the center meridian there. And, and, you know, asking why, why are those, you know, why do they look uh, movable? And they're like, well, no, they do move them. They plan for the future. And if there's a, larger jets or whatever needed to land in the state uh, in a state of an emergency they move all these 
pots out of the way and they have like a half mile long biggest runway in the world or something. So it's these kind of considerations in a city wow. like Singapore where they're thinking of the future. You know, it, it comes down to, you know, the train stations and the subway uh, down below. And, 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 you know, it's very much like Japan, the way things function there. They're, they're very timely. They're very organized. They're, they, they uh, are, are, you know, somewhat empty now compared to the population, but there's so many trains and they run so well, you realize they're planning for, you know, double the population and whatever, you know, a couple decades or whatever they're planning here in, 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 Sing- in Singapore. So those are the kind of attributes when you see a city like that and you go, mm, well, that functions really well. They were thinking ahead there. This feels like a city of the future as opposed to Los Angeles, which we know and love dearly, but Los Angeles is the city of angels and, you know, basically a struggling, you know, uh, turn of the century, a century ago, <laughs> architecture and roads that are, you know, um, um, you know, being adequately maintained to keep the city functioning while it too is kind of building and growing into a new, a new city. And, um, I think if you look at the first episode, you'll see there's some aerial shots where, uh, Jay Worth and the Visifex gang, took some aerial shots they did over the city and they and they married some aerials we did in, in, in Singapore and did their own CG work alongside of that. And you, you get a real feel for what, you know, Jonathan, uh, Nolan and, and Howard Cummings' real vision for the future of LA is in 30 years. Yeah, I, I love the visual direction you guys are going. I think it's, you know, oftentimes you see... Um the future looking like mm-hmm. a barrage of advertisement. You talked about that a little bit a few minutes yeah. ago too, but... The decision not to do that, I think, was very unique um, and kind of interesting. Like, is there yeah. is there a message in that? Are are we saying something about you know the state of advertising in the future or uh, the need to advertise in the future? Is there is there anything you know that you guys kind of talked about? We did, you know, and again with Jonathan and Lisa, it's it's more, it's 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 they don't really, you know, they they kind of feel like we're stumbling through certain technologies now, obviously everybody's obsessed with phones and tablets and devices and, you know, devices that, you know, in our cars that look like our phones and our tablets and this, wow, this is all kind of tying in. Yeah. And ultimately, ultimately what we thought was super cool, you know, applications and things that were like, this is so good. I love, I love, you know, looking at this and then suddenly there's pop-up advertising and it's, it's not, it's not advertising of the future. It's the advertising of the present and the past, mm. you know, and you realize, well, this is kind of the, you know, the level we're at. Yeah. Do you get in a, you know, walk down the street in Times Square and see massive LED screens or, or, or Hong Kong or on the Bund in Shanghai with the boats going up and down with, you know, 200 foot TV screens on them. And you think, wow, this is, you know, Ray Bradbury, this is, you know, that's what the vision of the future is. I think, looking at the show, you know, and what I've, you know, from my experience working with them is they think people are just going to kind of get over this at a certain point. It's not going to go away. The devices aren't going away. The, but it's not, it's not going to turn into a 3D holographic advertising world. You know, people will get, you know, people, I think they believe people are going to get over that, you know, that we're, we're, we're not going to have that in the future and that, and that hopefully is where we kind of put our foot down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting thought for sure and a new approach, or mm-hmm. at least for me, I haven't seen that approach before. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're deeply inspired by Singapore, but also mm-hmm. uh, were there any films that you were referencing as you were developing your look? We, we, tr- we look at a number, a number of, of, of films to fill out on a big screen what, what we want what we want Westworld to look at. And I think, you know, looking at, you know, obviously, you know, recent 2049 and Blade Runner and revisiting couple films and watching them has been, been very, very helpful. Like, you know, but I think it's, you know, the, the, the kind of cue that we really go for is working with Howard Cummings now, who's, you know, who's taken the baton from Nathan Crowley, production designer, and who, who set the, the look and the initial vibe for the, the show. But Howard is the one that's really, um, you know, in a wonderful way, kind of, you know, taking in all the attributes of, of what we're talking about and, and, and exploring and then coming back with concept art very quickly that are, feel, you know, feeling out these, these ideas and these visions. And that's the most exciting thing to us, I think, is to see, like, actually see the world on, on you know, a nice, 
uh, beautiful concept art rendering. And then that, then you're sitting there going like, okay, Jesus, that's what it is, you know, or no, it's not that, you know? And, um, so we kind of use those tools more than anything. We had a question from, um, mobile cyclist, one of our mm -hmm. listeners on Twitter at mobile cyclist. Um, He's asking, uh, or she, I have no idea who this person is, but thanks for listening. Um, how important is the role of storyboarding to a production? Well, storyboarding is a great process. You know, I mean, there's there's two types of ways to storyboard. One is to kind of um, really suss out something technically or action-wise that's, that's a very complex sequence, and you want to kind of lay it out and see all the pieces that you actually need and then do a breakdown of what elements of each frame how you're going to accomplish that, that this one might be a green screen shot here with a, you know, with a plate from another city or what, you know, or, and then a, you know, close up of an actor who's not, who can't be there for that scene. That's going to be in that scene as well, you know, so it can be a complicated or, you know, they're basically sketches that are kind of general roadmaps for a direction you want to go. And, you know, I think, you know, it's great on a show like Westworld because we're, we're the, the expectations and the bar again is set so high. The production schedule is still tight. Um, there's, you know, obviously we're trying to limit the number of hours and keep, keep that down as much as possible and uh, help change that for people in the future. But, but we're also working a lot of hours and when we're not shooting, we're, you know, we're working a lot of hours and we're, you know, it's, it's, um, it's important to have all the pieces together so that people can go to storyboards and actually figure out what they have to have prepared for any given day. And that's very helpful. And it's, you know, it's also for me, it's also um, sometimes completely useless because, you know, you've got a set of frames of a scene and, and we never have this in Westworld, but we've you know, I've had it in other, other shows or whatever where you're given frames, you know, of, of, uh, of storyboard frames of what to accomplish that day. And, and there you realize this is boring coverage and it's just reverse angles and boring coverage. And yeah. that's not Westworld. Westworld wants a moving camera, wants, you know, wants exceptional shots and wants graphic shots. And we do reflect those. Um, um, uh, Dan, uh, does, uh, Dan Kaplan does all the storyboards for Westworld. And I wish there was a copy book because they're actually, it is pretty, pretty damn good. His, his interpretation with the various directors um, and the level of storyboarding for the show is quite, quite good. So when you directed season or episode four, mm -hmm. were you, uh, I guess, how did you incorporate storyboarding as a director? Well, I actually, um, uh, when I directed episode four, I, I pretty much, you know, worked with John Grillo, the, the DP and Dan Kaplan on a couple of fight sequences just to, give these guys an idea of kind of, you know, for me, the limited coverage I was going to do on the fights. I mean, I, I've, I've shot many fight sequences for, for many directors and, you know, some are very judicious and, and know editorially what they're going to use. And some, um, shoot the fights out, you know, uh, uh, painfully on a level of having so many shots and so many inserts and, you know, I find that that's, you know, just overkill. So I specifically did it with Dan to kind of minimize the shots to say, hey, guys, this is, you know, I'm going to have four hours to do this fight sequence, you know, on one night. And these are the shots I'm going to get, you know. And so I purposely kind of kept them a bit thin for stuff like that. So I was also fortunate in episode four to come up with a sequence uh, at the very beginning that I, that I pitched to Jordan, uh, the writer. And... You know, the, it was a brand new sequence, and I knew I had to uh, also pitch it to Jonathan and, and Lisa, the showrunners and creators. So I decided, look, you know, let me get together with Dan. I'll bang out some storyboards. They can see it's a bit unorthodox, the this, this sequence. It doesn't have the visual language of the show. It kind of breaks a lot of the rules that were set. Let me storyboard it out, present it to them. And, and in this case, you know, I, I did a few pages with Dan and we came up with a sequence so I could present it, um, in a meeting. I mean, you have to be so fast at these meetings, um, Why? when you're, when you're with the show, well, because time, you know, you're, you're, they're dealing with eight episodes and, you know, very high profile actors and details of wardrobe and hair and everything of being what's shot today and what's shot in two weeks that, that when you come up to bat, uh, for, 
your your aspects of your episode, you're really going to be game on, and you got you know you've got to get it out there and make your presentations quickly and, hmm. and, and try to try to get to it. I mean, the quicker you can get to a creative discussion with a showrunner and writer of how to make the show better, as opposed to uh, just presenting and 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 not moving forward, you know, that the better off you are. You really do have to utilize that time. So they've got no time. You have this new yeah. idea you want to pitch for the yeah. for the opening shot. I mean, how does how does that yeah. get done? Well, again, you know, you show up, you go, you show an interesting picture, you, you know, you've, you've got, you know, a color, a color picture of a painting, you know, maybe as a reference for the feeling of, uh, of, of the sequence and you walk in the room and they see an interesting picture on the TV and they see a couple boards up that are, you know, you blew up a couple of your storyboards three, four times the size of, you know, it's catching their eye and it's like, let's talk about it. And you go to the first thing and you go through it and then you go through the next thing and the next thing and, if you can get them out earlier, they love you more for it. Um, and that's the way it is. <laughs> it's <laughs> fascinating to me yeah, that because you look at these, you look at these shows and you think everything was planned so far ahead, but then yeah. you hear stories about, you know, like yourself, not to say this wasn't far ahead, but it's like you come in, you're doing one episode and you are starting to make some changes to how you want to make the approach of it. Like staying well, adaptable to changes yeah. is so like, it, oh, when, you do. You have to say, you and have that, to say that's that. always fascinating to me because it just seems like such a fast moving process that has no room for mm -hmm. large scale changes like that. But I love the fact that that stuff gets done. I think that's, I think that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, last minute changes is, is, is just, ha it's, you know, I mean, as a director of photography, a director or whatever, you know, you've got to, you've got to be open to it. I mean, specifically, you know, on shooting episode one, I think Jonathan was really feeling out the world of, of what is, you know, what, you know, now that we're seeing dailies and we have actors and wardrobe and we see 50 extras in a scene, you know, in, in LA 2058, you say, oh, geez, maybe I'll back, you know, they're constantly modulating in the beginning. Maybe I'll back off the look of the extras here. There's, maybe there's a lot, we should have a lot more people here, a lot less people here, and they make changes for the next day. And then, they're seeing Aaron Paul's performance and the dynamic with with uh, Evan Rachel Wood, so they might be tweaking the the dialogue or seeing opportunity to enhance the dialogue or whatever. So that's all happening. And then, of course, as a DP, you know, I've already prepped the prepped prepped the episode with with Jonathan, but you know, maybe I'm walking in with a a, a shot list and expectations for that day and then you see the dynamic change on set with the blocking and and the opportunity for something else and you realize okay maybe i'm not as rigged light light wise or whatever but this is so much better the way they're blocking the scene than we all thought it was going to be so yeah we're going to react and get it lit and start shooting as quickly as possible to make it as you know great as possible yeah that's that's what we do and i think the interesting thing for me to you know directing um you know it was obviously very challenging you know daunted to get this experience you know like what well, these are friends of mine they're they're running one of the best shows on, on hbo and out there and the bar is high um you know and again they have top level actors and they they trust me to do one of their episodes it was great but i was 10 you know they give you 10 days to prep an episode and you know on, on that day um uh i started prepping i was basically told you know out of that script about 80 percent of it was going to change in the next four days <laughs> so i was like okay we'll pick a couple of locations or something i can prep and and wow pages like why why were prep. there so many changes well i think again this is you know i was coming in on on episode four i think they had expectation they had written you know this beautiful episode i love the episode it was it was fabulous and then you realize that now that they've shot and they're editing the first three and they're, you know, things are changing a little bit. They decided that they want to make some changes in episode four, which I guess, you know, showrunners are, you know, do quite, quite um, uh, regularly. So it was fascinating because, you know, you, you know, you're sitting there and you're like, oh, geez, okay, so that's 10 days of prep, nine days of prep, eight days of prep. Mm. So, you know, suddenly you're, I'm five days of prep out. I really still don't have a script and I know maybe 20% of the script is going to be in there. Oh my so, God. So you, you know, suddenly over the weekend you get that, 
that script and you know you're you're kind of trading emails on that Sunday to kind of line up new location scouting and then you realize okay a couple of these places are far so we might not be able to go back before you know we tech scout so try to bring John Grillo the DP and obviously Howard Cummings and you know go to these locations and say okay looks like this is in the scene's going to be in so we're going to let's let's prep this and then you know, you might even get some page changes that day, which are dialogue and action changes or something like that. So you really, you know, it, it's important to kind of, you prep what, what you can prep and you kind of, you, you, you just have to be ready to react to, to those, those type of um, changes. So it was, it was great. It was a good challenge. Yeah. How do you make that transition from DP to director on an episode? Like, is it something that they come to you and they say, you know, these are the 10 episodes we want you to direct this one, or is it something you almost kind of have to like, um, uh, like lobby for in a way? Well, I think my experience on this show is a bit different. Not, you know, uh, you know, again, working with Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy that I've known them now for, for five, six years and, you know, been, been part of this family of Westworld. And I've also gone on after I directed the fourth episode I won and I shot Lisa Joy's film Reminiscence. For Warner Brothers with Hugh Jackman and Rebecca Ferguson. So oh, wow, so you've got a great you know, relationship with these people. Yeah, and it, you know, it was whatever a year and a half ago with them. They were they they were asking me what I, what was I up to for a year. <laughs> wow. I know, I know when Jonathan asked that question, it's like okay, then here we go. And then you know, two weeks later, we're traveling on the world scouting, and, and next thing you know, I just came back from New Orleans shooting uh, his wife's film. So you know, it's you know, but but specifically for the the transition, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of DPs have to go through this um, kind of painstaking, you know, get get that, you get that season and then, you know, they call you to come back the next season. And then, you know, maybe you ask for an episode that season, they say no. And then, you know, we'll give you one uh, if we're up for a third season. And then suddenly you're on your fourth season, you might get two, you know. Um, as a director, you're talking about or as a DP? Yes, as a director, okay. yeah. So, so I think a lot of DPs have gone this route um, of of kind of accruing, at, you know, getting a epi- enough episodes to kind of get showrunners comfortable with them. But there's this kind of thing where it seems like there's a lot of DPs, and you know, you've had them on your show, and you've, you've spoken to them, Igor, and the people, and they they they're getting opportunities to direct from from the showrunners more than ever. And I think the reason for that is, look, as DPs were you know, uh, often, it, you know, on, certainly on streaming and, and cable and this type of work, network stuff, whatever, you're one of the mainstays on the show. People, directors come and go, ADs might come and go, yeah. but, but you're the one who's staying there shooting a lot. So, you know, I think showrunners are looking at the relationships DPs have with the crew and with the actors. And I think that's something for me that was a big part of Westworld. And I remember when I spoke to Jonathan the first time, I said, well, listen, I haven't you know, I haven't directed A-level actors by any stretch of the imagination. He goes, yeah, but you shoot them, you've been shooting them for 20 years or more, yeah. you know. <laughs> you know these people, you interact with these people, all you have to do is direct them. And I said, okay, great. <laughs> were, were you nervous? Like, did, did it get you kind of yeah, nervous to do it? Sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, you know, my first few days I had Ed Harris and again, it's a sequence I, I had pitched and they put in the script and um, it's a bit, a bit of a crazy sequence and, you know, Ed's, Ed's doesn't do anything, um, half level, you know, and this was a very physical kind of, uh, crazy little sequence in, in two beats there. And, and he, you know, every rehearsal is at maximum volume with Ed and every take is at maximum volume. And, and it's, it's, he's a method actor on some level because he just goes so deep and dark into the character that you, you know, when you're in between takes, you, you have no idea if you're talking to the man in black or Ed Harris. Wow. And I know Ed personally a little bit too, and that didn't help. <laughs> 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 Why? What do you mean? Well, it's just, you know, you're, you know, you're standing there and you realize, okay, well you're giving your, as a director, you're giving direction to somebody who's in this like heavy state of mind. Right. And, and you're hoping they're they're you know they're also listening to you on on a, on, a, on a, another level. Um, 
And in this case, I wasn't sure, you know, with Ed. But it's also this, it's, you know, also, you know, Aaron Paul joined the show and, yeah. and Vincent Cassell. I mean, Vincent Cassell, these guys are A-level actors. And again, you got Ed, you got Jeffrey Wright, Aaron Paul, Evan Rachel Wood, Tandy Newton, uh, John Gallagher, uh, uh, and Tommy Flanagan. All these guys, they're all, you know, great actors. It's not like one or two good actors in an ensemble cast that's, you know, fairly fresh. No, it's like, I have 12 days of shooting in LA and every day I've got major actors and major scenes, Tessa Thompson, every, you know, Oh my so, God. How so cool. I, it was great. But, but it's also the familiarity, you know, being, you know, uh, friendly with, you know, actresses like Tandy, you know, Tandy and, you know, knowing Rachel a little bit through, through the show or having photographed her so many days, you know, there's a film familiarity there when they see you and they, and they were very supportive and, and very open to me. And I think, you know, the, they were very thankful to have me as a director, um, and um, I appreciated it. Are you involved in casting at all? I mean, I know the primary cast is yeah. certainly already there, but like, are you involved in well, any think, of those extra characters that come in just for your episode? Yes, and that's if I could give any advice to any starting, you know, director, whatever, you know, is is to really stay on top of every single character mm. that gets cast. Your, in your show, you know, and that's, it's, you know, I was fortunate. I had some, you know, and then I directed a couple scenes in Singapore at some amazing locations as well. And, you know, that specifically there, you know, in places like that, geez, you're going out of market and you have, you're, you know, in the, our case, we're hiring, you know, from, from my episode alone, probably three or four top actors from Singapore to play, you know, be parts in, in, yeah. in, the, yeah. in, the, in the episode. And, so yeah, you really do have to stand up because it's it's you know again the showrunners are functioning at such a high level and then there's people like Kilter Films that are you know very specific working with the showrunners to help with the casting and interface with the great casting uh, directors they have there, but occasionally someone will slip through that with less experience or or that shows up and doesn't really uh, look or seem like the the uh, tape that everybody agreed on. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally, I mean, I think one of my uh, quick story was on, on uh, uh, I think it was my first day of shooting for the episode. I had Jeffrey Wright and it's another scene actually I got, uh, I wrote and had put in the script and you know, it's, it's a very simple beat where Jeffrey Wright's walking by this abandoned pool and an abandoned hotel. And he, he's, he, you know, the, this kid is watching, you know, like SpaceX rockets with his dad landing and taking off, but it's this humanistic moment where uh, the boy looks over at, at, at uh, Jeffrey as he's walking by and Jeffrey looks back and you see a little compassion, a little humanity from Jeffrey Wright's robot character. And, you know, I shot that day and I realized I had picked, I picked another young, young boy to do it, but he became unavailable. So, um, you know, they, they sent, sent another uh, young boy over, very nice young man. But unfortunately, one of the first things out of his mouth was, I don't want to be here and I don't want to do this. What? <laughs> you're, like, you're like, you know, you're, you're standing there. It's like, okay, this is my first day of directing and I've got a, an actor who, you know, unfortunately doesn't want to be there. And That was your you know, first day? The first day, first scene. And, you know. Um, why, didn't, why didn't he want to be there? Well, I think it's just, you know. How, you know, how young was this kid? He's about 12, 13. So oh, I think it's, well, I guess you know, 12, 13 year olds don't want to do anything. <laughs> they don't want to do anything. And it's also a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, you know, I just see it as a DP. There's a lot of actors, especially, you know, kid actors and younger actors out there that are been pushed into mm. being actors. They, they would rather be going out to play. And, and unfortunately, I had that boy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I've, I, out, he, he I've seen that job. even in my work doing commercials yeah. in the Boston area. There's there's a lot yeah. of child actors that you can tell are really yeah. just being pushed by their parents. Yeah. Wow, that's that's, that's crazy. So, all right. Now, the, so for the, so you are involved in casting, right? But how involved are you? Like, are you just getting video submissions? Are you actually going to castings? Like how, how in depth oh, no. is I mean, it? Yeah, I see in my episode, there was, there was a few characters that I asked, you know, I said once, you know, we collectively pick them, which we do with the showrunners and, um, the casting agents. And then, and then I, you know, in this case, I requested to see two of them and all the, all the ones, uh, in Singapore as well, because yeah. I knew, in Singapore, I had to meet everybody before I, I signed on to it. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's,
it's a thing where you can make a suggestion for sure as a director. Um, and I know DGA is trying to, to work through this uh, on a lot of shows. But, you know, again, it's such a, an amazing experience. I've, I could actually recommend somebody for a part to Jonathan or, or Lisa. And they, they would, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll certainly follow through and put their thoughts out there and nice. hire that person or not, you know. But unfortunately, there's a lot of shows where it's not contractually um there yet for the dga so apparently a lot of people are having trouble with with a lot of uh a lot of the casting situation where they don't so i know that's a it's part of the future negotiation dga is trying to get um uh, directors more involved with casting for their own shows how are you working with your cast as a director and how does it how does it differ from you working with them as a dp i mean this there must be some crossover I think that, you know, the simple thing is a, a DP, you, you know, you, you obviously read the script, you've, you've had time to, you know, sit with it, you have a vision of what it's going to be, you know, with these characters, and you've seen them act these characters before you get an idea what they're going to do, you kind of rig the lighting in a way that's, you know, hopefully going to accommodate some changes in the blocking as it occurs. And then, you know, you know, some are just going to completely screw you and want to do the scene on the opposite side of the room. And that's the way it is. As a director, it's you know, uh, it's kind of the same situation. You might have an idea of the scene, and you might do a rehearsal and and talk about the scene, and then an, you know an actor can turn to you and just say, "I just don't see it that way," you know, or "I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not taking the scene from that point of view," you know, or or you know something more gracious like i thought that was great but why don't we just try something completely reverse engineer the whole thing while we have the energy and try, try something new and that's those are the processes that are great i mean you know you do your prep you know your scenes you know the character arc you know the story arc i mean it's a director you know you're there as a container for and 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 you know you you've got a you know, a, uh, you're a signed writer and possibly a showrunner coming and going as you're going. So everybody's just making sure you're on track. I just had Jordan uh, Culper, the writer, was with me most of the time. And uh, Jonathan and Lisa kind of left me alone for 12 days in L.A. They think they showed wow. up once or twice, which I was kind of like... Um, well, they amazed. must really trust you. Yeah, that was, you know... And, and do, you, do you get resistance like that from the talent sometimes? Is that common? for, you know, the actors to say, no, I don't see it that way, or that's not how this person would, would react. No, or... I don't think, you know, I think it's, it's necessarily um, a confrontation too. I think it's an, you know, it's, it's an exploration because again, yeah. you might have an idea of what a character is really uh, going for in a scene. And, you know, you I might also be privy to information they're not privy to. Yeah. So I, I know what's happening in episode five and six and what a character arc is happening later. So it's also part of my job is to uh, make sure, you know, I, I don't give any of that information and that I keep them on track as a character. And there's times where you have to look at them and just say, you got to trust me on this one. So you're saying, you know? you, so you're saying that characters, they may not even know where they're going. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Don't. Like in a show like that, in a show like this, they only get their episode uh I think like the weekend before, or if they're lucky, five days before we start, they start shooting. Wow. Yeah. So again, as a director, you may, you know, what's going to happen plot wise. And you know, you know, some shows, I mean, I, I don't know if all showrunners share across the platform, but at least, uh, you know, I knew for various reasons, the arc of the show is as best as they all knew as they wrote it hmm. and what happens with certain characters. So, you know, again, as a director, you're in a situation where an actor may nail something and like, I, you know, I'm doing this because in the future I'm going to do this. Right. And then you realize that they just nailed it, but you can't, you just look at them and just say, let's just deal with the scene right now. You know? <laughs> and then they're like, uh, uh, so that means it is happening. Right. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's beats like that where you, you know, and then there's, you know, there's the, the hard thing is, you know, I think as, as a director in a show like this is, again, also the scale of the production, the number of people. And, you know, you've got the incredibly talented people like um, you know, Howard Cummings, the production designer, and John Grello, DP. And, you know, but you still have a limited time, Yeah. you know, and, and specifically in my episode, for various reasons, I wanted to cut down the number of hours. Um, we try to keep it to 12 hour days, which I was happy to do. And, 
but it's a, you know, it's a lot of, you know, as a DP, I know how long things take. So, you know, I knew by giving up a couple hours every day collectively over 12 hours and, you know, ostensibly giving away like almost a day or two of shooting, um, potentially, you know, um, so I have to, you, you know, you've got to really scale your ideas and, and, and make sure you get the right, the right shots and the right coverage for, for a great scene. I want to transition back to your role as director of photography for the first episode and just your lighting approach to Westworld mm-hmm. in your episode. I mean, you certainly the set design, production design, all of those things are helping create this futuristic world. But mm-hmm. I'm sure you have to think about things like, you know, how, what is the lighting like in, in this far in the future? Oh, um, yeah. How does it change? Yeah. Like, talk sure. to me about your kind of lighting approach to um, certainly your episode, but also just Westworld in general now taking place basically outside of the park. Well, I think this, the, the simplest thing we're seeing around the world right now, Ben, is the, the, the kind of urban night landscape is changing, you know, for, for decades we you know, the world is surrounded by sodium orange light yeah. and kind of this greenish metal highlight or mercury vapor, blue green light at night. And that those, those, these two colors were kind of pervasive throughout the world, you know, again, for the last 30 years, there were, there were the phase, uh, from, from fire and tungsten into gas lamps around, around the world, cheaper gas lamps. And, you know, uh, you know, now we, you know, started this in the last, I don't know, five, six, eight years as this transition to led, they're pulling all the sodium and metal highlight out of the cities so that the cities are becoming white light. And you'll see it in LA, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll drive down, you know, Mateo street and you'll still have, you know, six blocks of sodium. Then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll turn the corner and be on third street and it's all, all led going up and down third street. And, and you realize, so geez, that's, you know, I photographed the street 50 times for movies and it was always orange and, and green, <laughs> and now yeah. it's white. So, you know, kind of that's that's the big kind of the big biggest signifier to me is also this, this color the color shift at night it was one of the most important things to me. Not, you know, I just shot a movie uh, before Westworld that was a kind of a new a gritty New York movie that wanted a kind of a nineties um, uh, street feel to it. Twenty one bridges? Are we talking about? Yeah, twenty one yeah. bridges. But yeah. you know, that was the the kind of metal highlight and, and and sodium world. So specifically when it came to this, it was like, let's get these colors out, you know? And, you know, what I do is I do, a, you know, some, some base tests with color temperatures for skin tones and background colors and streetlight colors and headlight colors. And what are the fluorescent lights in the background colors? And, you know, what, what are the rules of the game color wise, you know? And, and again, I, I think it's showing more than, uh, anything is the most important thing. So I bang, you know, some, you know, inexpensive tests just to get a vibe for what the feeling and the color temperatures are. And I kind of lay that out. And, and, um, Jonathan, uh, you know, and, and Howard way in and, kind of write up a little rule book, like, you know, don't light, you know, faces warmer than 4,300 Kelvin, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever we get from the test kind of gets put in, you know, no, no, no use of the theatrical colors like, unless it's seen in these certain circumstances, right? Because, you know, there's, there's times where, where, you know, DPs could, can, take liberty on a, on an episode and change the look quite dramatically. So things like specifically like theatrical gels, we wanted to make sure that every well, DPs knew like we're not, that's not part of our vision of the future, right? Our, our, our vision of the future is in this world of color at night. And this is our, our you know, look in the daytime. That makes sense. Cause the exterior lights are certainly going to be different as technologies mm-hmm. change, no matter what, it just is what it is. Um, Talk to me a little bit about your approach when you're just doing more traditional, you know, you're, you got a small scene, two characters, coverage, that kind of stuff. Like, what are you well, I using? Think it's subtle. It's subtle. You know, it's, you know, I'm using the same tools as a director of photography um, for lighting, you know, and, but I think the, the biggest difference for me, and it, it goes back to early films that I've done and everything is building backgrounds. And that's, that's what people, a lot of directors of photography and cinematographers aren't paying so much attention to right now. What do you mean? 
what's in the background? What's in, what are your backgrounds? What's in the background of your close-ups? You know, what do you, you know, how do you build life in the background of a close-up? You know, because the close-ups tend to be um, more screen time than wide shots. You know, unless you have a, a you know a very different show. So I find like a lot of times director of photography are kind of building the building the master or the mini master shot and they're putting all their time and look into that 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 feeling and then when they go to close ups they don't have out of focus lights or a surface with a skip light on it or a or a, you know matching a color on one angle and matching a reverse angle, you know. So you know, if you've got a blue background in one and an orange background in another, yeah. editorially, it's not very pleasing. And I'm seeing a lot more of that, you know. And I realize, you know, I used to, you know, uh, it used to be a big deal for me, specific, specifically shooting anamorphic films, was kind of managing the psychology of depth of field, you know, specifically at night. I would light my night exterior, sometimes like a five, six, eight ND two stops down for the wide shots. So I could pull off ND for the close ups because I knew on a, a 135 anamorphic or whatever at a, at a, at a 2.8, the entire background would just be a, a blurred mass, you know, and I wanted two more stops to have a little more intermediate focus or something again, building backgrounds, you know, and, and, and that's something that, you know, certainly talking uh, with the other DPs on the show, I try to get them to think about it. And what I did is, you, I mean, it's like simple scenes. Like there's a scene with um, the Aaron Paul. He's on this thing called Re- Rico application, which he's basically agreeing to go commit a crime online uh, when Lena White shows up at this place. And all the close-ups I put in, like reflections of vertical tubes behind Aaron Paul's head. Okay, mm. You see him in the wide shot or, or one of the wider shots, but when you go to the close-up, it's these kind of elements. And this was what Jonathan wanted. You know, he's like, get future, futuristic elements in the frame when you can. And one of the biggest ones is obviously reflections in glass. You can, you can, you know, I can, you know, get stuff in there without overdoing it. So I encourage John and Zoe and the other DPs, like, you don't have to do a lot. Just do something subtle. Put a reflection, a graphic reflection in something or you know, again, tube or come up with a, you know, something art department wise to put in the background that's got a futuristic shape that, that ties into that set or whatever, you know, so that, that's important to me. And it's, it's, um, again, it's kind of managing backgrounds uh, and close ups. Yeah. I I like this idea of building the background. I don't think I've ever heard anybody Mm -hmm. talk about that on the show. It, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to like understand it as you, as you're talking about it. So you're just thinking, I guess you are just paying more attention to what the backgrounds of your close ups are, but you know, okay. Say you're doing a beautiful street scene at night. Yeah. Right. And got, you know, in your wide shot and it's kind of favoring looking down the boulevard, right. And looking down a beautiful you know street or nightscape in, in, in San Francisco. And, and, you know, you, you, you swing a lens. Now you're, you know, kind of a tighter wide shot and it's, nice out of focus lights, but then you go in for your coverage or your, your close ups, however you're going to photograph those. And suddenly you line it up for the blocking and you realize, Oh shit, there's nothing in the background there. There's, Mm. you know, there's a building with a, an alleyway and there's nothing to see there. So, you know, what I've often done, I'm, you know, many DPs might just swing the action a little bit to pick up a, a background here or there, but you know, I would have already, had you know like a a xenon skipping that wall in the background and maybe taken three or four babies or dados or or smaller units with very subtle uh nightlight gels whether they're street light colors or 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 bus color or or whatever and have those ready so that when i swing to a longer lens on that angle i'm built a background there i've mm-hmm. already got something that has shape by skip light on the surface. I've already got out of focus lights behind their head that kind of look like, you know, the master shot. And, you know, I think that's what I talk about building backgrounds and, and, you know, I guess there's two schools of thought is, is one is, you know, stay authentic and let it happen for what it is. And then the other one is, you know, take the liberty to be more interesting and also um, potentially more emotionally evocative. And I think I, you know, tend to favor that second one is, you know, I'd rather take the risk to be uh, more evocative and make it interesting visually. Well, something I'm noticing in your work on Westworld is that uh, 
certainly that I, I wasn't, th I, when I look at your, um, the still shots as I'm, I'm sort of scrolling through your episode as we talk, mm -hmm. I'm looking at your close-ups and it's weird because now that you're talking about building this background, the idea of building your background, I'm noticing mm -hmm. a lot of attention and action in that background. The other thing I'm noticing is you're not keying very he like heavily. Like your key lights are no. pretty dim. Like the faces are in a way your the backgrounds are more eye catching in some shots than the faces are. Mm -hmm. Um well I yeah, I think you know, it's also, we, we kept it rich, we kept it dark. And I think, you know, I have to love Jonathan Nolan for that as, you know, he, he, we, we did the premiere at the Chinese man. So I had to do a DCP, so I had a theatrical pass, right. For a DCP for the screening. And he was like, Oh, let's just make it darker for the screening. Cause we're going to, it's going to be in a movie theater. And oh, I, I love like, that. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, the irony is I have to check it. I've only, I saw, I'm afraid the, uh, show went out slightly bright because I saw it on my television uh, up here in Oregon, and it, which was adjusted pretty well. <laughs> it appeared a little bright, but um, the show is on the dark side for sure. And yeah, I think it's, it's how do you, how do you light at night so that it doesn't seem lit? How do you make people, it's, 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 it's tough because in the show, you, we also want people to look good yeah. and we want to shape, shape their faces in the close up and make them, you know, uh, and that's always been important for me is getting in on the close ups and shaping faces a little bit. So you add a slight underlight to bring out a jawline or a, a little kick on the back of a you know, cheek or something to, to bring out a facial structure, or, you know, that, that, that the idea that light doesn't come from one light, it comes from, from many, many sources, you know, especially in close ups. So when I go to the close ups, I like to shape it and make sure you know, we're building some good backgrounds and that's a lot of, a lot of it too is a B camera, um, consideration because we shoot a lot of B, a second camera that tends to be very tight. So, um, on this year we had Robert Campbell, um, B camera operator and, you know, he knows I like backgrounds so, and foreground. So he will build, you know, he knows as soon as he gets a half interesting shot that I'm going to want it to be twice as interesting. So he'll build <laughs> lights and reflections or rack focus, things to rack focus to or whatever, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, because the show does have a classic syntax. It's, you know, it's not a show like The Outsider or, um, you know, uh, something extreme like that with a di different visual syntax. This is much more classic, but we're trying to keep it um, interesting at the same time. In our last few minutes, I want to talk about camera movement. Mm -hmm. And we have a question from um, Meadow Days on Twitter, at Meadow Days. Uh, they want to know what inspired the use of continuous shots like the one with the rear view camera. Okay. You know what we're yeah, speaking about? Great. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, uh, well, the rear view camera shot is actually um, Jonathan's, that was something, that was his idea. And that's something that we storyboarded for, for the show. And, and again, it's, I think with, with uh, Jonathan, at least in the showrunners and the ideas, like, you know, you come up with shots and ideas and, and we encourage all the DPs, you know, come up with some visual challenges that way that'll, that, that will will tell the story in a different level, and, and you know, listen, Jonathan presented this idea. What if we did this whole scene like through the rearview camera? You know, and, and um, you know, obviously, there's elements with Evan Rachel Wood in the foreground and the background of the shot, but we 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 stuck to our guns on it. And I have to say, it's just these type of shots. We may not be reinventing the wheel, but when you stick to your guns and you pull off a shot like that, and you realize. Hey, we just want the tension of just staying in the car and looking at the rear view camera and seeing the action. And, you know, you see it all comp together and you realize, okay, it does have a different emotional level. I think it's great, you know, and I, and I think it's a, it's a comment for, uh, you know, cinematography in general in shows like this is how, how can, you know, we're seeing it, how to elevate, you know, the cinematography emotionally, um, and we're starting to see some some new new styles out there, which is quite good. Yeah, I mean that shot in particular is one that I think a lot of people are thinking about and and um, really enjoying. Um, yeah. But talk to me about just your approach mm -hmm. to camera movement in general in the series. And I know you just did the first, but you directed yeah. the fourth. But I think in, even earlier in this in this interview, you talked about that Westworld wants dynamic camera moves. It wants you know a certain aesthetic to it. Um, yeah. 
Talk to me more about that. And then also tell me about what does that actually say to the audience about mm -hmm. this world? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb with, with camera movement is, you know, to, to minimize gratuitous camera movement whatsoever. And I, you know, yeah. the, the A camera operator, Chris Harhoff is quite amazing. And I've done a few movies with Chris and, 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 uh, fortunate enough to have him on, on Westworld, but it's, we don't move the camera gratuitously. It's more about when we move it, how is it being moved? What is the dynamic of the shot? Mm -hmm. And like you said, what is, you know, once you develop three or four shots like that on a particular lens, you're developing a visual syntax or style. And I think, you know, we have that in, in, in Westworld, there's a certain amount of, uh, coming and going into scenes that, that specifically we do a lot of, um, you know, pushing over or, or right behind a character or pulling a character into a scene, uh, and, you know, kind of, a you know, unusual convergent shot of a high angle graphic or something to tie, tie a location in. There's, there's uh, probably a dozen of these things that we talk about that we try to get all the DPs to kind of, um, go for it you know, and, and, and come up with these ideas, but it's, it's, um, you know, it, it really does have to come from the story and, and it also has to do with transitions we believe and, you know, specifically for the show. And, uh, that's been a big part of it too, is moving in and out of scenes and how to get in and out of scenes, uh, visually. And sometimes we do that with camera movement too. And the last couple of minutes, do you have any advice to, you know, budding filmmakers trying to navigate this world, wanting to get into um, the type of, you know, cinematography that you're doing, high level TV shows, films, all that? Where do you start? How do you break into the industry? Well, I think breaking into the industry is the, you know, is the, the key thing is who are the people around you right now, you know, um, working, you know, on the level that you're working and who's talented around you and who's going, who's going to be pushing in the future and surround yourself with these people, whether they're, uh, directors or DPs or actors or, or, or editors or whatever, you know, these are, these are the people that are, are going to go down, down, down the, down the road with you. And at the same time, uh, you know, it's, especially in the, with the virus thing now is, is, is really, you know, how to discipline yourself for the craft. I mean, if you want to call yourself a cinematographer, then you need to shoot every day, you know? So if, even if you're shooting photographs uh, with your phone in your apartment that you're not supposed to get out of for the next three weeks, hopefully, you still, you know, come up with a, come up with a challenge, like three great photos in three minutes, you know? And come up, you know, find ways to train yourself to do things physically. And, and at the same time, uh, don't burn yourself out on the internet, but find, find ways now to be inspired. You know, yeah, look at those movies that you haven't looked at for five years. Look at that movie that you, you really don't want to watch, uh, that you think you know, there might be of some merit to you. Force yourself to, to do, uh, to take, put the time in, you know? And I think the other thing is like the industry is, you know, we, we all have a perception of, of, um, you know, how hard it is to break into Hollywood and New York or wherever around the world. And, but, you know, I, I, I didn't have any friends or I knew no one in the film business. I, you know, I walked onto sets in New York city right on the street and walked up to uh, people in the camera department and, ask questions and, and, uh, cause I knew I wanted to be a cinematographer when I was, you know, just starting, um, uh, school college. So, um, yeah, you go for it. And I, and I think the last thing, you know, just quickly is just set your sights on a couple of small things that are attainable. Like, you know, within your realm, I'm going to work with that person in three years and, and systematically go, you know, go through your connectedness to that person and put the dots together yourself. Don't rely on agents. Don't think you need an agent to do all this stuff. You know, you're the one who has to put the dots together. So start doing it. I love that. I love that. Paul Cameron, ASC. Of course you can see his work oh, thanks. on Westworld and uh, his website, paulcameronDP.com. We'll put a link to all of that 
in the oh, show right. notes. Well, Paul, thank you so much for coming back on the Go Creative Show. Stay healthy, stay creative, you keep too. keep doing what you got to do to, you know, keep those muscles flexed. That would be awesome. All right. And um, all right, thanks, man. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see your episode, and hopefully have you back for your next big project. All right, great. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. There he goes. I want to thank Paul Cameron for coming on the show and sharing his experience uh, working on Westworld and all other things. I also want to thank you guys for listening. Please don't forget, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and follow us on all the social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We give you an opportunity to have your questions heard on the show. I want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, for putting this whole thing together behind the scenes. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com and Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good and he can do the same for you you can find him at gainstructure.com gainstructure of course I want to thank our sponsor MZ Education for Creatives without them the show wouldn't exist so please support those that support us and we'll be back next week with another episode of your favorite podcast The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. 